What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. It's been far too long since I made a good hazy IPA, so today we're gonna be tackling that one. We're gonna be doing it with a dry yeast. This is gonna be the first time I've ever used Lalaman's Verdant IPA Dry Yeast. This is only available from Lalaman, and it's uh, supposedly a very good New England IPA style, hazy IPA style yeast. So we'll see how it is and how it performs in this one. I spent a really long time picking out the hops for this one, and I really think they're gonna work really well together, and I'm very curious to see how it turns out. Now, normally, when I do my hazy IPAs, I do a single dry hop uh, right about the high Krausen stage, just to kind of minimize the chance of oxidation, but today we're going all out. I'm gonna be doing a double dry hop for this recipe, which does make this a little bit more complicated than if it was just a single dry hop. However, I am hoping to explain how that's not necessarily a huge deal. You'll see some techniques in this video that I use to make that double dry hop really not too much to worry about. So before we jump into the recipe though, I wanna thank two organizations for helping support this channel. Firstly, Northern Brewer, they sent me all the ingredients that you need for this batch of beer that includes all of those hops. So do check them out for ingredients, equipment, all that good stuff. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they manufacture the system that I've been brewing on for the last two years. It's a good system, I stand behind it fully and it's available in 120 and 240 volt versions, 10 and 20 gallon systems as well, all fully electric. Go check them out, go check out their website and their YouTube channel as well uh, for some more information on that. So now for our recipe, we're gonna be starting out with nine pounds of Best Malt's Best Pilsen Malt. I'm using Pilsner Malt as a base on this one because the golden naked oats are gonna add a lot of color to the beer, and we don't want this to be too dark. The uh, ideal color for a hazy is pretty, pretty pale, actually. Uh, so using Pilsner Malt is gonna help keep this on the paler side of things. Secondly, we're adding two pounds of oat malt to this beer. With a hazy IPA, usually you want at least 25% uh, up to 50% of your grist to be high protein malts, uh, something like oat, wheat, that sort of thing. A good way to do this is to add in flaked grains, and we certainly have those in the recipe, but you don't want to overdo it with flaked grains because that can actually really significantly increase your chance of oxidizing this beer. And oxidation is the absolute enemy of hazy IPAs. So one of the earliest things you can do to prevent that oxidation is actually to take what you would add for flaked grains and cut that in half and replace half of it or more with the malted version of that. So we're using a lot of oats in this recipe. We're using two pounds of malted oats, and then we're using a pound and a half of flaked oats, followed by a pound of golden naked oats, another form of the malted oats. And then finally, we're adding in a pound and a half of flaked wheat. So that way I have three pounds of flaked grains in here, which is actually 20% of the grist, but at the same time, I'm also adding three more pounds of the malted version of the high protein malt, which in this case is oats. So what we are doing in a scientific sense is we are reducing the amount of reactive oxygen species that you would get from flaked grains by substituting in some of them with the uh, malted version of that grain. Now for hops, the most important part of this entire recipe. I'm gonna be using four different kinds of hops in this recipe and we are using a ton of them. Uh, most of them are going to be in the dry hop. So first of all, there's no hops during the boil. There's no need to do a very long boil in this one. We're just gonna stick with a standard 30 minute boil. It's enough to get rid of DMS in the beer and break out some of the proteins that we don't want, but not so much that it's gonna add too much color to the beer or just waste our time. So 30 minutes is all you need. Once the 30 minute boil is over, with, then we're gonna chill down only to about 160 degrees Fahrenheit and begin a whirlpool. We're gonna add hops during that time and that's gonna extract loads of fruity flavors and aromas and these lovely oils from the hops without isomerizing them or causing bitterness. So this is how you get loads of fruit flavor without necessarily getting a lot of bitterness. So we're gonna hold a 30 minute whirlpool at 160 Fahrenheit and we're gonna add two ounces of cryo mosaic as well as two ounces of Mandarina Bavaria. Now, cryo hops uh, are a really lovely tool. One ounce of cryo mosaic is equivalent to about two ounces of standard mosaic hops. It's a great way to get the same amount of punch and character uh, and hops in your beer without necessarily increasing the amount of hop material that has to go through and circulate through everything. So it's a very useful tool for this sort of thing. By adding in Mosaic and Mandarina Bavaria, I'm hoping to get a nice orange character that blends in with some of that lovely tropical fruit you'll get from Mosaic. Mosaic is so named because it blends so well with its mosaic of flavors with almost every other hop. That's why you see it so frequently in hazy IPAs. 
And then we're gonna do a double dry hop with this one. The first dry hop is gonna be at High Krausen, like two or three days into fermentation. We're gonna be dry hopping with two ounces of Mandarina Bavaria, one ounce of Cryo Mosaic, one ounce of Vic Secret, it's the first time I'm using this one, and one ounce of Azaka. This is gonna be a blend of mango, papaya, tropical fruits, and oranges. As the hops go in during this high Krausen step, they interact with the yeast in a process known as biotransformation. The compounds in hops and yeast interact and bind to proteins that you get from that high protein malt. And this causes that haze, but it also gives you a really, really powerful tropical fruit character and that's why we dry hop early in this type of beer. We're gonna leave those dry hops in there but then we're also going to do a second dry hop after the fermentation has completed its primary stage. So this will be a day like five to seven um, and then we're gonna leave these dry hops in the beer a bit longer. So for this second dry hop I'm gonna be using the same hops but just different quantities. One ounce each of Cryo Mosaic, Mandarina Bavaria, Vic Secret and Azaka. All of these going in at day five to seven and staying in the beer for five days or so. For the water profile on this beer, we are going to shoot for a water profile that has a higher chloride level than sulfate level. And what this does in essence is it actually keeps the beer from being overly bitter. Even though we are adding hops later in the whirlpool and during the dry hop, they still can impart some sort of bitterness to the beer. And we want to cut down on that by balancing the water profile to favor malty flavors. And how we do that is increasing the chloride to sulfate ratio to roughly two to one. So the water profile I'm targeting is 60 parts per million of calcium, three parts per million of magnesium, 13 parts per million of sodium, 99 parts per million of chloride, 49 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of spring water, and I'm adding to that eight gallons of spring water, two grams of gypsum, one gram of Epsom, one gram of sodium chloride, and five grams of calcium chloride, and that'll get me that water profile. This will also give the beer a very nice soft character. Uh, the pillowy fluffiness that you expect out of a New England IPA is due in part to the water profile. For the yeast on this one, as I mentioned, in the beginning, we're going to be using Lalamin's Verdant IPA. This yeast is very good for biotransformation, which is an important part of the hop character of this beer. And we're going to be adding in two packages of this because it is going to be a relatively high gravity fermentation. For the mash on this one, we're going to be sticking with a relatively higher uh, mash temperature, about 154 Fahrenheit for about 60 minutes. The reason for this is to create a higher level of body in the beer, and that is an important thing to blend with that heavy amount of hop flavor that we're going to get. A medium to full body in the beer is really the target for this particular brew. We're also going to be fermenting this one under pressure to really lock in all of those hop characters. So I'll talk more about that in the fermentation section, but for now, let's go ahead and get this brew started. So I started out by adding eight gallons of spring water to my 10 gallon, 240 volt claw hammer supply electric brewing system. As this was heating up, I milled out all of my grain and I separately milled the oats because the oats actually have a much smaller kernel on them and require me to set my mill gap a bit narrower or just mill it twice in order to ensure that you actually crush those kernels. After this, I also measured out all of my water salts and added those into the strike water as it was heating up. Once the water had reached the mashing temperature of 154 Fahrenheit, I went ahead and I mashed in with the entire grain bill, being sure that I broke up all those clumps and distributed the grain in the mash evenly. So I let the mash recirculate for about 10 minutes before measuring the pH and saw that it was actually a rather high pH, about 5.7. So I added about a cap full of lactic acid into the mash to help bring it back down to a more reasonable level. I let the mash rest for about an hour at 154 Fahrenheit and then I raised it up to a mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes. Once the mash out was done, I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for about 15 minutes. At this point, I began the boil, and I boiled for 30 minutes. So at the 10 minute mark, 20 minutes after I began, I added in some yeast nutrient. Note that I did not add world flock as usual since the spear should be hazy and I don't want to hinder that haze. Once that very short boil was over, I began to chill and whirlpool. Using my accelerator, counterflow chiller, and the spin cycle whirlpool arm, I quickly chilled everything down to 170 Fahrenheit, which took almost no time at all, and then set the element to maintain 160 Fahrenheit. 
and I added in my Whirlpool hops, which was two ounces of Mandarina Bavaria and two ounces of Cryo Mosaic. I let them steep and recirculate through the Whirlpool uh, for about 30 minutes and then immediately continued the chill to bring it back down to pitching temperatures. At this point, I set up the Clawhammer Supply fermentation keg and transferred the wort into it. I also oxygenated this time using pure oxygen um, just to be really sure that this thing goes along quite nicely. I added two packets of Alamand Verdant IPA and uh, set up my airlock. Note that this airlock has the capacity to be used as a spunding valve as well. The spunding valve on it is currently set to zero PSI, so there's no added pressure. At this point, I put it in my fermentation chamber and left it to ferment. I'm gonna cover more details of the dry hopping of this beer here in a minute, but I added my first set of dry hops on day three and added my second set of dry hops on day seven. After adding those dry hops, I also applied pressure to the fermenter uh, and left it to ferment at a, a higher pressure for the next several days. All right, so now for the fermentation on this beer. This is a very important part of the beer. Even though the beer is 99% hops, do not neglect the fermentation because it is going to help you achieve that high hop flavor. Once again, it's worth mentioning twice, oxidation is a real threat here. The reason why is because of the amount of hops involved, because of the amount of flake grains going in, it causes this beer to be much more susceptible to oxidizing and turning brown and having dull hop flavors uh, than other beers would otherwise be. You want to counteract that by avoiding opening your fermenter really as much as possible and by doing closed transfers between fermenter to fermenter and fermenter to keg. If you're bottling, you want to make sure you're purging the bottles with CO2 before you're filling them and that will help you really reduce that oxidation risk. I have a whole video on this topic I'm gonna to link up in the corner that breaks it down into a lot more detail, a lot more techniques. You might wanna check that out if you're brewing hazies a lot. It's okay to open the fermenter during that first dry hop because it's actively fermenting. It's creating lots of CO2, it's pushing oxygen out of the fermenter at all times. So don't worry too much about dry hopping that during that high Krausen stage. It's after that stage that things become more dangerous. So the second batch of dry hops is gonna go in at the same time as the first batch of dry hops, but it's gonna go in a bag, which is gonna be secured by sous vide magnets, which are silicone coated magnets, which will hold the bag of dry hops up underneath the lid of the fermenter. So that way, the CO2 from fermentation flushes that space, keeps the hops fresh, and then when it's time to dry hop for that second dry hop, all I do is remove the magnets from the outside of the fermenter. This drops the hop bag down into the wort, causing uh, that second dry hop to happen without ever opening the fermenter. It's a great hack, and it's one of the best ways to do an oxygen-free dry hop without expensive equipment. The other thing we're doing to cut down on oxidation though is pressure fermentation. Um, so you'll notice I'm using this claw hammer keg fermenter. Um, this is something that they sent out to me to try and I wanna use it for pressure fermentation because pressure fermentation is a good way to lock in all of these hop aromas and hop character uh, to this beer. Uh, an active fermentation with lots of dry hops in it sometimes can blast all of that hop aroma out of the fermenter and the CO2 from fermentation can strip it away and then you're left with a beer that doesn't actually have as much hop character uh, in it because all of those oils have been actually dispersed into the air. So fermenting under pressure really does help that out a lot. However, you don't necessarily need a claw hammer keg fermenter to do this. You can do this with actually a regular keg if you're already kegging, or you could do this with a Firmzilla all-rounder, which is a mm, about $75 fermenter made out of PET plastic. It's pretty good. You could do this with a steel unit tank as well. There are many options out there. It's becoming a very popular technique to uh, pressure ferment, and it's honestly a pretty solid uh, way of doing things. So I'm actually gonna start this fermentation with a natural level of uh, pressure. So just atmospheric pressure. We're going to ferment at atmospheric pressure at a lower temperature, about 68 degrees. This is to keep the esters from that English yeast from getting out of control and causing rotten fruit character. Once we reach that high Krausen stage, then I'll do my first dry hop. 
Again, no pressure involved in that one. I'll set up my bag of dry hops and the magnets for the second dry hop. At that point though, I'm gonna set my spunding valve to, to maintain about 10 PSI in the pressure fermenter. This is actually gonna lower the amount of Krausen in the fermenter. It's going to lock in more of those aromas from the dry hops, especially that first edition. Once that first set of dry hops goes in, I'm gonna raise the temperature and keep it under pressure. We're gonna bring it up to about 72 to 75 degrees, which is gonna increase ester activity in the beer, but not necessarily the bad kind. Uh, because we're gonna be under pressure, that's actually going to keep that all under control. It's a nice technique. And then we'll drop in those second set of dry hops uh, and leave them in there for about five to six days, I think. And then at that point, I'm actually gonna transfer out of the fermenter using a closed transfer going into a keg. That keg is gonna sit at room temperature, about 72 degrees, uh, for another week to help. Uh, it's actually gonna be a diacetyl rest, which is gonna help fight hop creep which is the diacetyl that is created from dry hopping at a warm temperature. Dry hops actually contain a small amount of enzymes, which actually unlock a little bit more sugar for the yeast to ferment, uh, which can cause diacetyl if you package too early after dry hopping. So this is a good way to help fix that hop creep and prevent it from happening. Just leave it at room temperature for a diacetyl rest for about a week after you're finished dry hopping and getting it off of those hops. The other reason why you don't want to leave the hops in there for too long is because it can cause grassy off flavors, which may be unpleasant uh, for some folks. That extra week in the keg is also going to help uh, keep the hop burn under control. Hop burn is an astringent flavor that can be created by massive dry hopping like we're going to be doing here. It goes away after about a week or two, so if you do experience it in a fresh New England IPA, don't worry too much because it will go away and then your beer will taste much better after a few weeks of conditioning time. Now if you don't have access to Lalaman Verdant IPA, there's plenty of other options for yeast out there. Um, any good English strain is really going to be a good option here. So something like SO4 would actually make a decent New England IPA. Same thing is true of perhaps like the London strain, uh, but also consider the liquid side. Imperial has some phenomenal New England IPA focused strains in the form of juice, in the form of Conan, which is the uh, heady topper strain. If you know that beer, it works really well. It's a very, very good hazy IPA strain and an excellent biotransformer. Plenty of English strains are available from White Labs and Y Yeast as well, so there's no shortage there. But also consider that Norwegian Kvike may actually be a very good option as well. Hornendal Kvike, especially when fermented hot, and Voss Kvike, when fermented very hot, really do kick out a lot of tropical fruit and orange-like aromas and esters that blend extremely well with New England IPAs. But just consider, if you're brewing with Kvike, that it's actually going to uh, ferment so hot and so fast and so aggressively that much of that hop aroma can get scrubbed out by the aggressive CO2 uh, produced during the fermentation. So just keep that in mind. Pressure fermentation is a very good idea in those situations. I know it seems like a lot of information at once, but trust me, just go through the process a couple times and it will get a lot easier. Hazy IPAs are not exactly the most easy beer in the world to brew, especially as a new brewer. It's a lot to wrap your mind around if you're freshly starting out with these things. But trust me, do it two or three times, you get the process down, you will be rewarded and you will make some outstanding beer. So just to recap, we're fermenting uh, using two packets of Verdant IPA at about 68 Fahrenheit. We're gonna do our first dry hop at High Krause in about two or three days into fermentation. We'll raise it up to 72 degrees and start putting pressure in the fermenter up to about 10 PSI. Keep that pressure in the fermenter for about another five to eight days. Once the fermentation has completed its primary stage after the first week, we'll drop our second dry hops in via the magnet technique, and then we'll leave the dry hops in there for five to eight days. At that point, fermentation should be completed. We'll transfer into a keg using a closed transfer, and then we'll let it condition at a room temperature for another week or so before putting it on tap. At that point, it should be good to go. Anyway, I'm hoping this works out really well, and I'll catch you guys in a few weeks. So until then, Cheers. Fermentation for the beer went really well overall, uh, just about as planned minus a few things. So since I fermented without pressure for the first few days, I didn't really pay attention to it and uh, the natural shape of the fermenter really encourages High Krausen to creep out of the uh, airlock and that's exactly what happened here. I had a lot of yeast overflow and just uh, make a huge mess. 
But other than that, everything went really well. I added in my dry hopping addition and I used the magnet technique to drop the second dry hopping addition on the appropriate day. After two weeks, I hit my much lower than anticipated final gravity of 10.09. Because of that extra drop, I actually ended up getting almost a double IPA's worth of uh, ABV out of this at 7.4%. So the beer is called Ocean Haze, and it comes in at 7.4% ABV and a calculated level of about 16 IBUs. The overall color of the beer is quite pale. Uh, it's a nice, hazy, uh, not particularly thick haze or murky haze, but just a nice bright haze. Um, it has a really good, solid, pale yellow color to it. Um, catches the light quite nicely and it's a little bit lighter colored than some commercial IPAs. The head on the beer is absolutely amazing. It's a nice bright white head uh, with some really tight bubbles and a really solid structure coming from that high protein malt. Uh, it really has a, a nice character to it and it sticks around for a very, very long time. Before we get too far into the tasting section of the video, I do want to make known one thing, and that is that the Clawhammer Supply fermentation keg that I've been using is actually still a prototype. There are still some design changes that need to be made with it before it actually goes into full production, but I believe they are on back order, so just be aware if you're looking to actually buy this thing. That being said, it's a very interesting fermenter option, um, and you know, I would do an actual review on it if it was a completed product, but because it's still in the prototype phase, I'm not really going to discuss too much more about it. Anyway, now let's go in for the aroma. As it should be with this kind of beer, it's one of the most aromatic kinds of beer there is. The aroma is very powerful, just a massive punch of papaya, guava, mango, and citrus all coming out together. There's not very much space in the glass for me to even get close, and I can still smell an incredible amount of aroma. It's really a very tropical bouquet of aroma and uh, very inviting indeed. So let's now go in for mouthfeel. There's definitely a softness and a smoothness to this beer that definitely worked as intended. However, um, the actual overall body of the beer is a bit light. It's a medium to medium light overall mouthfeel. It still works within the style guidelines, but I do prefer my hazy IPAs to have a little bit more substance to them. Um, and I think that's just a personal thing. And there's a reason why this ended up the way that it did. First of all, the Verdant IPA yeast actually does tend to attenuate a little bit more than other popular New England IPA strains. So that's one of the reasons why it got down so far. But secondly, I did have my dry hops in there at a higher temperature. The reason for that was so that I could get them to do their entire hop creep process and get rid of the diacetyl before kegging. That hop creep process um, will also have a side effect of drying out the beer a little bit as well. So there is something to be uh, said about that contributing to the lightness of this beer as well. Really minor nitpicky thing here, not a big deal overall in the grand scheme of things. So now let's go in for flavor. Hmm. It's an extremely powerful hop flavor that I love. Very soft, fruity, juicy, very juicy overall. Um, and a relatively low bitterness, just about the way that this should be. Has definitely a nice little menagerie of hop flavors at play here. Um, not all of them agree with each other though, but we'll talk more about that later. The overall flavor uh, is a very strong, powerful, juicy character um, that is really quite nice. There's no real recognizable malt flavor though, besides the uh, small amount of Pilsner that you kind of get from the base. There's no apparent contribution from the Golden Naked Oats, uh, which is kind of a disappointment as well. It's a bit of like a puffy, somewhat crackery malt base to it, um, but I could use a little bit more, I think, in my personal opinion. The hop flavors that are coming through are really quite expressive. Um, it's really dominated by mosaic, um, and that's not surprising at all, considering that all the mosaic I added was cryo, so it was basically double strength. Yeah, that led to a really nice papaya and berry and slightly resinous kind of character that mosaic is known for. Layering on that, I definitely pick out the Mandarina Bavaria as well, and that's coming through with a slightly kind of bitter orange character. Uh, and then on top of that, we're getting the Vic Secret, which is coming through with a really strong woodsy note, and that's the one that doesn't quite play well with the others. Um, it's a little bit more woody, I think, um, and earthy and uh, that sort of kind of department um, than I was expecting it would be. There's definitely tropical fruit contributions from it, I believe, um, but they're far outweighed by the mosaic, and it leaves behind the woodsy kind of character that I'm not a huge fan of. And lastly, the Azaka is there. The mango and the 
passion fruit uh, that Azaka is really known for is really quite strong in this. There was some hop burn in this that did go away after about a week, um, so it was a little bit of a harsh, astringent, dry kind of bitterness to it uh, that faded after a week in the keg when it was able to let those solids fall out of the uh, beer naturally, fall to the bottom. And until that point, it was pretty harsh to drink, but now it's actually quite juicy and quite nice. Um, there is still a little bit of a lingering bitterness there though, and I'm not sure if that's due to the beer being a little drier than I was planning on, or if it's due to um, just leaving the hops in the whirlpool for a little too long. Potentially both of those things. Um, so I think when it comes to potential improvements, I really would focus on maybe a shorter whirlpool um, and maybe uh, you know swapping out that Vic Seeker for something like maybe Amarillo, uh, some other hop that can play better with those fruity characters and leave behind less resinous, woody kind of character. Um, I would also increase the amount of golden naked oats in this to both provide a little bit of extra dextrins to raise that final gravity, but also to add a little bit of a small amount of sweetness to the beer, which will help uh, in the long run as well. Otherwise, I really wouldn't change a thing because the uh, character of the beer is quite nice. The Verdant IPA yeast did a really great job, and pressure fermentation seems to really be the way to go to get the most out of your aroma to leave as much hop character in there as possible. Yeah, previously in the past, I've made plenty of IPAs that have uh, been heavily dry hopped and I've lost a lot of the hop aroma and a lot of that character during the fermentation because the CO2 would strip it out of the beer and put it out into the air. And hence I had a rather disappointing IPA at the end of the process. This is not so. This is easily one of the most loaded uh, with flavor IPAs that I've made in a long time. So whether you're fermenting in a keg or a firmzilla or so unit tank or some kind uh, or any other kind of pressure fermenter, this is definitely a good method for brewing IPAs, and I think it makes a big difference, personally. But overall, this beer was quite popular with the people that drank it, and um, I'm a big fan of it as well. It also masks the alcohol percentage quite well. You can't really tell that it's 7.5%. It tastes more like it's a 5%, feels more like it's a 5% beer, um, which is always a nice thing as well. There's no hot alcohol notes or anything like that, either. So at the end of the day, I definitely enjoyed the process. I learned some things, and, um, you know, I learned a little bit more about how these hops are going to play with each other and i hope you also learned something and i hope you enjoyed the video as well and if you did please go ahead and hit that like button and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already comment down below with your thoughts and experiences on this whole thing i do enjoy reading those comments and it means a lot to me if you want to support the channel there's a number of different ways to do so but i think one of the best and easiest ones is to pick up a t-shirt from the merchandise store such as this one you know if you want to get down with the thickness there's a uh <laughs> an option to check this one out in the merch store but there's plenty of others uh plenty of other designs down there as well it helps support the channel and you get something out of it at the same time otherwise i also have a patreon and my patreon supporters really are a huge boost to the channel and its production quality you guys are responsible for a lot of major upgrades i've made in the last several months i also have channel memberships super thanks button is there as well if you feel inclined to hit that all those things really do help me out a lot and i sincerely appreciate them I also have an Amazon store, which is in the description box where you can find a lot of the things that I work with in terms of production and in terms of brewing, uh, things that I use consistently and can stand behind the quality of. Do check it out if you're curious. I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check that out as well. Oftentimes you'll see what's going to come to the channel in a few weeks or a few months. Uh, I do enjoy sharing a lot of random other things there as well. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me when you watch all the way to the end because I put a ton of work into these videos and the graded glass ones usually take about 20 to 30 hours of production in general um, and it takes a lot of work so when you're watching all the way to the end I know that you're getting the most out of that and that's why it means so much to me so this one goes out to you guys and until the next one cheers